Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this, this Dataversity webinar, the Data Trifecta, Privacy, Security and Governance Race from Reactivity to Resilience, sponsored today by Anonos. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change it to network with everyone. To find the Q&A or the chat panels, you may click those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Joseph Summer, Owate, Steve Prestige, and Gary Lefevre. Joseph is the Managing Director in the Data and Analytics Practice of EY Financial Services Office with 30 years of financial industry and consulting experience. Owa is the Vice President of Data Governance and Privacy Engineering for Capital One and is a seasoned tech executive who most recently served as Global Chief Data Architect for Yahoo. Steve is the Chief Commercial and Innovation Officer for Anonos with more than 20 years of experience in digital, helping clients use their data to full advantage. And last but not least, Gary is the CEO and General Counsel of Anonos, who's worked at the intersection of law and tech for 35 years, including as a partner at law firm Hogan Lovells and is an architecture uh, Accenture consultant. And today, Gary will also be the moderator for our esteemed panel. And with that, I will give the floor to Gary to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. So we're excited about being here today. And we want to make it very clear, the data trifecta that we're talking about today is actually your privacy, security, and governance teams. And I'm going to go over some stats and some other background information as a lead-in, but then we're going to go into six questions that each of our panelists will answer. And through these discussions with our panelists, you're going to see how providing these teams, your privacy, security, and governance teams, with both the technology and the remit to work together, enables your organizations to evolve beyond reactivity to resilience. But even more importantly, particularly in today's times of fears of recession, massive layoffs, this data trifecta approach with the right technology and remit can actually lead to increased innovation and profits that are several magnitudes greater than what you have today. Yes, I said magnitudes, not a percentage improvement. So what are we talking about here? We hear a lot of people talk about data is the new oil, right? But the reality is oil gets used once. And once it's burned, once it combusts, it's gone. It's no longer around. But with the right data trifecta attitude, technology, and remit, you actually can change data not into the new oil, which is really a single-use asset, but the new water. And what I mean by that is with water, you absolutely have to be careful, okay? You can use water incorrectly, and it could be tainted, poisoned, et cetera. But if you use water correctly, it's generative. It regenerates. It replenishes itself. And you'll see through the discussions with our panelists that that's what's possible. So if your organization is willing to adopt a new mindset to challenge what it's done in the past, you actually, as I said, can increase your innovation and profits several magnitudes. So what's the problem and how come more people aren't enjoying these types of productivity gains? It's actually a misconception, a widespread misconception, right? that reactive functions such as privacy, security, and governance are necessarily at odds with your more proactive functions, analytics, data innovation. And that attitude is actually a big part of the problem. But if you can get these different groups to work together, enable them to do so and give them the tools to do so, the results can be, well, near magical. So let's take a look at some background statistics and research. And we want to thank 451 Research, S&P Global Market Intelligence, 
Uh, this data all comes from their, their research voice of the enterprise, data analytics, data management analytics review that they did. So here's the interesting thing. Look at the power of what's on the slide. All the things that effective privacy, security, and data governance can deliver, right? Who wouldn't want all these things in blue? And certainly the two in purple, right? Faster speed to insight, faster relevancy, higher quality data. So what's the issue? Well, the issue is this is how those same groups are perceived by the business as impediments, as obstacles that have to be overcome. And one of the reasons for this, and this, I have to say, was one of the results of this analysis I found at first most striking, but then as I thought about it, it actually made a lot of sense. Look who actually is responsible for implementing, in most organizations, privacy, security, and governance. When you come right down to it, right, over 65% of companies delegate that to IT. And that's simply not fair. And what I mean by that is IT is not tasked with the job and opportunity to enable this kind of expanded data use. And IT is more likely to look at the inventory of the tools that they have in place and say, yeah, I got that. But the reality is the interplay between these different data protection techniques are absolutely critical. And so you can protect data using any one of these techniques, how effective that protection will be and how widespread the utility of the data and the fidelity and the timeliness will be for the data users is a very different matter. And so what's needed is to allow these different groups, privacy, security, and governance to work with IT, don't get me wrong, but they need to look what's needed to support each individual data use case. This is what we look at as the seven universal data use cases. And the reality is what's necessary to protect data and enable data innovation, utility, and insight are very different for each of these, as are the legal requirements. And so expecting IT in and of itself to have the wherewithal and expertise to give you the best test dev and demo data, maybe you can accomplish that. But those same tools are not going to allow you to jump up to use case five and share data with service providers, which includes, by the way, cloud providers, as well as outsourcing. So each of these different use cases requires a different combination of skill sets and techniques. But the reality is, with the right technology, with the right remit to the data trifecta, it's almost like this barista machine, okay? Where the same source data, the same coffee beans can be used to deliver very different outcomes. And we like to refer to this as lean data. And what we mean by that is for each of these seven universal use cases, you're delivering just the data that's necessary to meet the needs of the user, no more. And this is something, this level of granularity, modularity, and scalability that no one data protection technique can satisfy, but rather a platform approach that enables you to pick and select and actually automates many of the functions to embody and reflect your own organization's subject matter expertise does in fact make it possible. So again, we're gonna start off with our panelists' views. We have six different questions we wanna ask them, but how many in the organization would not be interested in moving from a mindset that's predicated in, in many respects, outdated approach to protecting data that are incompatible with the new use cases so that we can have much more effective insights and fidelity and utility, so as, I'll say it again, you can improve and increase your innovation and resulting profits several fold. So we're very honored to have the three speakers that we have here today, we're very lucky. And we're gonna start with this question. What do you think, and this is gonna be targeted at AWA first, 
What do you think about characterizing data as the new water versus the new oil? Do you think it works? Abel, what do you think? Uh, hey, Gary. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, I certainly, I certainly do, do think that it does work. Um, I might actually uh, take that even one level further, Gary. I, uh, I, I think in some circles, folks have actually heard of me uh, talk about data as the new uh, cappuccino, right? Because it, in my <clears throat> Uh, for the things that I care about, uh, for example, um, making sure that uh, sensitive information is not, um, it's it's taken out of the data in, in a manner that doesn't impede the analytical value of the data. It, it helps to think about it like a cappuccino, which in the simplest sense is just milk and, and, um, and uh, coffee, right? So, and when, when you, uh, think of the milk as sensitive information and coffee as just the facts and the raw data, you, you, you tend to find out that once you've mixed those two things together, they're incredibly hard to, to kind of separate apart. And what I really love about the, the image that you um, shared er earlier about the, the, the different use cases and the different baristas, you, you, I believe you called it the, the lean view on data it's it's it just hits the point right um i'm very interested in making data available for um folks to do to leverage for uh, the the maximum amount of analytical use cases that um uh, our, our users have consented to but I, I'm also super interested in doing that with the, the least amount of friction possible. So what I really love about adding in just what you need at the right time uh, for the right use case, it, it kind of goes back to that whole um, concept of, uh, uh, you know, water having this characteristics of, uh, 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 you know, reusable and available with the right level of quality at the right time. Um, and when you add in milk, like I like to talk about in terms of sensitive information, it really drives home the points that um, uh, it, it, how you bring in data into your ecosystems is gonna be really, really important because once it gets to a certain state, it can be hard to um, bring it back. So hopefully that, that touched that point there, Gary. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Awas. So, Joe, from your perspective, what, what is your experience or thoughts with regard to this approach to data, which is selective and, and tries to not only maximize its utility and applicability, but doing so in a way that makes it replenishable, near inexhaustible? Well, I like it. I like the concept a lot, uh, Gary. I think it uh, it ties into several properties of data that are important for us, you know, to consider. I mean, the first thing is that data has value, and so you know, so does water, right? And in fact, I could think back to the time when water was considered not that important. The idea of buying bottled water. I remember Evian when Evian came backwards. The joke among my friends was, "Oh." Evian spelled backwards is naive because who would buy water in bottles when you get such great water? It's so plentiful, it comes from the taps. So water's ubiquitous, right? And that's how data first seemed. But then eventually people realized, hey, water is scarce. Water is valuable. People built entire businesses around water. People have reinvented water with adding vitamins to it and other stuff like that. And, um, you know, there, there are economies and industries built solely off of water, which at one point was not considered other than, you know, in, in areas where, you know, it's drought regions and that sort of region, you know, uh, it was considered plentiful and maybe not that valuable at all. So the idea that one water is, it has value and so does data, I think is important. The second thing is that, you know, data and water both take different states, right? Water, you can freeze it, it can be liquid, it can be steam. I think when it's frozen, it's locked down. Nobody could get to it. When it's steam, it's leaking out of the organization and anybody can get to it. So we want to get the water in that liquid form so we could use it, we can transport it, you know. Uh, and uh, I don't know if anybody's ever had a chance. One time I was driving to Maine and I was near Poland Springs and I was like, I like Poland Springs. That's pretty good water. I'm going to go visit the factory. Let me tell you, you can't visit the factory. They have it locked down like a military complex. They're protecting their data because that's their most important business asset. However, 
they also have a fleet of trucks and distribution. They ship water. And I get a five gallon set of five gallon jugs from Poland Spring up in Maine, uh, you know, every, uh, you know, every month. And so they've, they've solved both the problems of let's ha protect our water supply, which is a valuable asset, but let's also have a distribution system that we can safely make it available where it's needed for people in their homes. And I think that's the problem that privacy, security, and governance are trying to come together. How do we keep our data safe while enabling its usage? Well said, Joe. Steve, do you have any uh, other insights or perspectives on this? Well, I'm, I'm not sure I can go past that. That's, that was, uh, I was very impressed, yeah. Um, but for me, Gary, look, it's very simple. It's, it's a great, it's a great leveling. You, know, you see the world is made up of 70% water. And I see the companies that we're dealing with. It's all about the data. It's all about how it flows. It's all about how it's I'm going to redirect it. And I love the idea of this concept of reusability. You know, so reusability of water, reusability of data. And ultimately data becoming more of an asset. Um, jo Joe said it so well how, you know, Water has been it's been devalued, but now it's highly valued. And I think data is the same thing. So all of our clients, you know, all of our all of those businesses out there are looking to basically be able to make better decisions, drive higher productivity, stronger business outcomes, and new revenue streams. And I feel that the concept of of the reusability of data as as per water is a is a great concept. So one of the things that I love about these webinars or podcasts or public speaking is, is I find that adrenaline really helps to sharpen the mind. And so you've all just heard one another speak to this. I'm going to time you now. I'll give you each 30 seconds to summarize why you think this analogy works and why you think it'd be helpful for organizations in such a time as we're at. So Awa, go. Um, why I think the analogy of water versus oil, <laughs> I, yes. I, I, well, just really both back to what I said earlier, um, uh, the, the data has to flow within the enterprise. It has to get to the places where it's going to have maximum utility. Uh, the, the fact that it's reusable is, you know, at various levels of quality it, uh, for different parts of the business, it's actual, ha it's, it's own, um, uh, utility in there. In fact, we already talk about data in in terms of water, data lakes, data data streaming, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So I think there's there is value to businesses, particularly from the perspective of being able to reuse the data asset once it's already been uh, uh, created or or transformed into a data product by another business unit. Um, it, there there are. Um, uh, there's lots of value in, in thinking of it in, in that term. So it makes it easier to describe uh, to, to the business. Fantastic. Uh, well said. Joe, your turn. 30 seconds. Go. Data has value. <laughs> data flows. Data takes different shapes. Data can be used in a, I'm sorry, water, <laughs> right? Water has value. <laughs> Water flow. See, it's such a great analogy. I could use the words interchangeably. There you go. Um, yeah, but it, it flows. It has value. It takes different shapes. You want to protect it. You want to enable usage. Its value is increased over time. And industries have been built up around managing water uh, in so many different ways. And I think that we're moving to a data economy uh, where the ability to manage data, ingest data, share data are going to be all key business capabilities, much like transportation, logistics, electricity, and other things that changed the way the world worked previously. Fantastic. So Stephen, let us always put you at the end so you can't say all the great things that Awa and Joe say. Yeah, but it's your turn. 30 seconds. Go. So for me, you know, I, I mentioned it, I think people can't survive without water. Businesses can't survive without data. Um, to be able to flourish in business, to be able to survive, the usage of data slash water is a requirement. Um, and ultimately, if we can do that successfully, we will not become extinct. I love it. All right. I so think he, uh, Gary, let me interrupt. Yeah, yeah, I think please. he topped us all yeah. with that. Yeah, no. <laughs> that was the best answer right there. But fuck. I'm telling you, I, I think the adrenaline <laughs> of being put on the spot brings out the best of people. You all three did fantastic. So thank you for that. I, I think we go with Steve first next time. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. So this one, we're going to start with Joe. 
Okay. Um, and the question is really, what is the role of collaboration, controls, and customization for turning no into yes, or maybe we could even say from turning oil into water? What's your perspective on this? So this is an area where I've had some experience working with companies that are wrestling with the data dilemma, uh, trying to balance between keeping the data safe and adhering to privacy uh, obligations and reducing risk, while at the same time enabling analytics use cases uh, and a variety of other business needs. Collaboration between the data office, privacy are essential. Throw in InfoSec as, as well, but definitely between the you know privacy and the data team collaborating to say, look, we both need to go to the business to accomplish certain goals that are relevant to our functional areas. Let's that do let's do that together in a coordinated fashion. It'll save the business some time. Um, and also it'll help us meet our remits to keep the data safe and enable its usage to understand what we have. Now controls become a big part of that. By having co effective controls in place, um, like I've worked with some privacy teams working for the data offices where we've shown that we have effective controls, whether it's moving to like granular row column access or ways to transform the data. So therefore it's less risky because it's been de-identified um, or because we have uh, the ability to provide the privacy team with reports showing who had access to this data, how often they use it and control detecting if there's a, you know, abnormal usage patterns, um, they make privacy more comfortable. And then ultimately, this has to be customized to the organization's culture, because the real issue here is not technology, it's people. And so we need to get people together to understand how data is managed, how we're keeping it safe, how we're enabling usage, that we have the right controls, that we don't get ping pong between privacy I mean, I've seen some business groups just pull their hair out. They're just trying to solve business problems. And um, they're going between different functional areas, following these kind of manual processes, going back to your point about proactive. Um, wouldn't it be great if we could make the data available safely and monitor its usage instead of having to put a three month, four month manual review process in front of every use case. So that's how I think they tie together. Well said, well yeah. said. Awa, do you have any, any perspective on that as well? Yeah, I was just gonna add to that. I think, you know, from a, a collaboration standpoint, um, right out the back, like one of the biggest problems that you see, it really doesn't matter what industry you go into is um, you have data pro proliferation. And that generally comes from, you know, the fact that uh, just several copies of the same data that are just found all over the, the entire enterprise. And, and teams don't generally collaborate on, you know, creating standards, right? You have multiple standards for a uh, postal number um, uh, or a phone number. And uh, it, this, this comes from a, perhaps like a, a limited amount of collaboration. Now, increasing that starts getting, you know, folks to go towards a direction of data products, right, and, and domain-specific um, uh, expertise on, on a particular data asset so that you don't have to copy it, or you can leverage existing standard data products to create um, new data products. Um, on the topic of controls, I, I would have to agree with uh, Joe in, in that sense, right, and I'll, I'll just bring it back to kind of what I was uh, you know, talking about earlier, um, in in today's day and age, you you generally, from a um, time to value standpoint, you, when you're you're going you're going through your your uh, uh, classic analytical use case, you want to make sure that a you have the right data asset, um, and b it doesn't have any sensitive information in it. So that governance process tends to increase your your time to value, right? You know, Joe, you mentioned three, four months. I've heard of use cases where that's, you know, eight months, nine months, sometimes the horror stories where it's 18 months. Uh, and that horror story becomes even worse when after 18 months, you find out that, that the project is not viable because um, you, the, the data assets don't really make sense. How, how can we go from a place where um, 
these manual processes exist today um, to a place where the controls are actually baked into the data and where wherein um, our enterprise customers, our end users of the data, if you may, can um, very quickly go from, I have an idea to discovering the data that they want to, to test the hypothesis with and doing some really um, uh, um, uh, a deep analytics, whatever that, whether that's uh, uh, BI reporting or whether that's machine learning, um, that getting to that place where it the data just flows, right? It's it's kind of it's that's for me that's the mission. Uh, I like to think of um, I, just bringing it back to your point to the point earlier of just um, data like water. I can't explain to you the complexity that exists between the water that flows and uh, uh, the, the streams, right? And how it gets into the, the water plant, flows through the, the public uh, uh, plumbing system and then the plumbing system in my house. I just go to my sink and I turn the faucet and water flows and I have a cup of water. That's the kind of simplicity that uh, enterprises from a consumer standpoint, meaning an enterprise customer needs to get to, I want data, I get data. Not I want data, let me sit around for four or five months and maybe I'll get the data that I think I'm getting. I love it. Steve, uh, you, your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, obviously the big question for everybody, every client's working on modernization projects. Um, for me, those modernization projects really need that collaboration and it's critical, but it's really difficult. Really, you've got, you know, you've got that data team that, that Joe talked about, the privacy, security, and governance teams. There's really four different conversations happening there. So ultimately, it takes too much time. So you're talking about controls. You know, for me, a platform approach to controls gives you the focus, gives you the guidelines, gives you the rails, you know, that, that gives you the proven methodology and the approach to build collaboration which ultimately flows into standards that I think uh, Joe mentioned, right? Which means that when you know you have standards, you can think about automation and ultimately you can get data into more of a utility, which is what I was talking about. So I think this, this is one of the, probably the critical conversation. Yeah, and, and the idea of controls that flow with the data is just really consistent with the concept of data as the new water, right? Uh, and, and the reality is it does help you to collaborate because the people who receive the data that has the controls embedded in it can only make the intended and authorized use. And therefore you could create different versions of that data for different use cases and customizing them. So that so that's great. Uh, so uh, well, we're gonna have you start off with the next question. What do you see as the impediments to enterprises shifting from more of a data loss prevention, right? To a, a data maximization, resilience and sustainability, right? So. What do you think the biggest challenges and 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 you know boogeymen are that would otherwise make that impossible? Um, I I I think you know I'll just boil it down to like you know the four main areas of data management and data governance that um, exist at various varying degrees of maturity throughout enterprises. Right, um, number one cataloging. I need to know where all my data assets are um, so that I can discover them. I, you know, I need to know what I, what I have. Um, assessing the quality of my data in, in a very uh, timely fashion is also going to be important to me. Like that poor quality data for one user might be incredibly rich quality data for another user, but not knowing the quality of the data is just useless for every user. Um, access control management, knowing who has access to the data for what use case, for when do they need access to the data and for how long, right? Like the time, time limit. Um, and data lineage, understanding where the data came from, where the data is right now and where the data is going and tying all that in um, together in a nice little bow where, you, you as an enterprise are trying to drive responsible use of the, of the data for your, uh, for your end customers. I, I think that, you know, 
that on paper is easier said than done. And various enterprises are at ver varying rates of maturity across those domains. And I, I think once you, you get to a place where all those, those uh, data management uh, and our data governance domains are just really humming and are talking well with each other. Uh, you have real good clarity on um, uh, the sensitivity of the data and therefore understand which use cases it can or cannot be used with. Um, only then do you achieve like really high velocity of, of the utility of your data. Well said. Joe, your thoughts. Uh there are a lot of impediments that I see and part of what I do for a living is to try and remove them and come up ways that fit for certain companies to, to solve those impediments. The biggest one we hear the most about is privacy concerns and uh, you know desire to make sure that you're not violating any laws related to uh, privacy. Uh, you also hear, and this has been for some time, you know, information security is probably the most mature in terms of you know security breaches the penalties associated with that the risk are now embedded into contracts like every contract you sign with a vendor now will have a whole data section on liability and limits and that sort of thing so concerns about what if something happens to our data and what if our privacy laws are violated you know alleviating that risk is a top concern Another big impediment is the fact that many organizations have federated data environments mm -hmm. and they don't have a way to pull their data together and they don't have a catalog. Imagine if you ran mm -hmm. a business and you say, oh, I have a warehouse. I don't know what's in it. Or I've got <laughs> dozens of warehouse all over the world. I don't know what's in each of them. But the, the cost is so everybody wishes there was a bot or something and, you know, chat. Chad GBT could read all your data and figure out what the data means and put it into a catalog like a library, you know, or Amazon book, book finder type of thing where you could find exactly the data you need to get all this great metadata about it. You know, I think the, you know, the, uh, you know, if you go to buy a product on online, it's going to tell you, you know, where, where, where it came from, how much it costs, uh, what are some quality review ratings, what it does, size, specification. Yet data, you it's often contained in tribal knowledge inside of people's heads. So not knowing what data mm -hmm. you have and um, you know where to go get it is another big impediment. Uh, and, and, and that takes effort. And I think it takes an investment to go clean up those warehouses, organize them, tag everything, install a computer system that says, we're gonna keep track of our data and where it moves to. Um, and, and then I think the final thing is, business engagement and demonstrating business value like logically you could explain the benefits of protecting the data enabling it for analytics um, cataloging it uh, measuring data quality all these sorts of foundational uh, good practices but to really get the business to engage and gain benefits from it they need to see that they need to see the value they want to see an roi and so hard charging business executives are going to say, well, before I get behind this, you know, expensive enterprise data project that I'm kind of skeptical about, I want to know the ROI, I want to know what it will do for us. The good news is there's so many examples now uh, of firms that have successfully leveraged data for economic value, generating insights, creating new products, et cetera, that it's a much easier case than it used to be. So. Now, those are the, the big impediments I want to highlight. Um, uh, Joe, Joe, if I could just uh, add a point there, Gary. Um, I, I think, I think you, you just drove a point that uh, I really like uh, what you did there. You said, like, imagine you had a business where you had widgets that you sold and you have warehouses of it and you didn't know what was in the, the warehouses. Um, you know, it just imagine you're a business owner and you didn't know who went in and out of those warehouses and what they're doing with the with the, whatever was stored in there i think it just drove a shiver down my spine i am a data <laughs> professional and I, I know this stuff but just imagine just thinking about that in in in, in stark terms just made drives the point quite home 
Absolutely. Okay. Right. I mean, you're, you're really looking to embed the trust in the data uh, and, Correct. and so you know what's happening. So, Steve, any thoughts on this particular question? I'm going to be two, take two seconds. Um, uh, I know Aaron and I, and I think Joe and I have, have talked about this uh, over the times. Um, you know, everything I just heard from both Aaron and Joe is all about, you know, governing all of the data. Highly complex, highly time consuming, very costly. And because we're trying to govern and control everything, it becomes high risk because you, you're, you're, you're doing so much with it. I do like the concept of how do you now govern just the sensitive data rather than 100%? If you feel that the sensitive data is 5 to 10% of the overall data stack, if you can govern and control just the, the 5 to 10% rather than trying to do the whole 100%, you start to see some significant advantages. Makes a ton of sense. Steve, Steve, I'd like to push back on that for just a second. <laughs> Go for um, it. And, and here's like why. Like because <laughs> um, I have seen a lot of clients, they'll say, oh, here's my data set. It's got, you know, 800 data, you know, data elements in this data asset. Okay. And yeah. then I'm going to look at the, the, the 80 that are, you know, sensitive or possibly sensitive. Okay. So first I need to identify those 80. Then I need to protect them. I need to figure out how I'm going to protect them. Then I need to maintain them and see where they go. What if I could take that whole data set and make it in a way so that it was usable, but I didn't have to filter out the, the sensitive from the non-sensitive because I protected the whole thing. I locked down the whole warehouse, but you could still buy, go in and out. We know who went in and out and you could you know, create good products that you sell based upon what's in that warehouse. And I think that more holistic approach to data in the end could be more efficient, at least until the tools get good enough to say, this date is a birth date, not a date the contract was signed or whatever. Right. And, and Joe, you know, maybe I was joining, but I, I think we're agreeing. Yeah. I think we're agreeing. Well, we're, I, 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 we're, we're absolutely agreeing. I think the, the, the points where I'll just double click on is uh, if you were to at the data, let's call it the data production, data creation side of things, understand the, a little bit better the characteristics about the data, like, um, you know, what what the, the metadata, if you may, right? A and um, also, in addition to that, you can actually start scanning that metadata, uh, the, the, the data that's flown in on, with an understanding of the metadata itself, you can start really like getting really good about not letting sensitive information get stored in, in your ecosystem where it's not supposed to go. It's like, you know, your, your logistics system where I'm going to send my diamonds into the vault and I can send, uh, you know, the 800 ton logs of wood um, to, to, the, to the, the, the lumber yard in the back, right? It's still valuable. But you know, I can store that outside, whereas you know the diamonds are probably need to be stored in a, in a stronger vault. Well said. You guys are better when you're spontaneous, so keep it up. <laughs> All right. So, so this one, not that you're not good otherwise. Uh, so this one is for you, Joe, to start with, right? You know, based on the different client engagements and work that you've done personally and or you're familiar with that EY has done. What do you see as the benefits from trying to converge these different perspectives, right? And, and what do you think enterprises can realize? Because look, it's not what's done today. So why do something <clears throat> different? Uh, the number one benefit really is about efficiency uh, and effectiveness, really one and two, right? It's efficient. If you think about, and I've worked with teams where we brought together the privacy, info security and, and office of the CDO together to come up with a unified engagement model for the business. And we also did unified reporting up to the leadership for the data program. This saved everybody time. Uh, it reduced the number of interactions, it reduced the number of obligations, it made the data related work uh, that was being uh, asked or required or mandated of the business uh, more manageable. It made it easier to support them. And so by converging you know, these three together, uh, it, there is a lot of efficiency to be gained. Um, the second piece is effectiveness as well. Uh, when, they're when there's coordination, 
you can really measure the results and and do that in a unified way. I mean, I'll just be honest about it. And I think we all know this. Sometimes politics are involved. And sometimes it's easier for, you know, some of these groups, privacy or isol, you know, security to isolate and say, I just said, no, we're not doing it. Prove me wrong. Make me do it. I mean, I've seen that type of posture because it's risk and they're managing a functional area and they're like, I don't need to take on the risk. This is where the senior leadership needs to come in and really say, look, as part of our business strategy, we need to enable data usage. We can't leave it, leave our goods just locked up in the in the warehouse to rot. Like you think of like some of the farm programs where they're just letting you know corn spoil and uh, you know silos uh, to keep the price up. Um, you know, it takes somebody to be the grown up in the room and to say, we do need to enable this and work together. So when that happens, you definitely gain efficiency. You see more effective you see more effectiveness. And I think it also starts to speak of being a data culture, you know, data-driven firm, a firm that makes the decisions based upon data. How can I be a data-driven firm and make rational informed decisions based upon data if I can't get access to any of the data that our business runs on? Yeah. Well said. Steve. Yeah, oh, wow, gentlemen. So, um, yeah. Look, I, I, Benefits really of having, a, I'm going to call it a platform approach to those controls, is doing all the things that Joe mentioned, right? It's, it's speeding the process up. It's enabling you to deliver rules and controls into the data that flow with the data, which ultimately means that our privacy teams and security teams can say yes to more projects, and our data teams can get access to that approved data much, much quicker. It, you know, speeding up all of the processes and obviously reducing the risk. I just thought I'd throw a little uh, curveball in there and go to you as opposed to Awa. So now Awa, you get to clean up on this one. <laughs> I, I think you've, you've uh, done an excellent job of keeping all of us on our collective toes, <laughs> Gary. Uh, um, listen, um, I, I personally think that Privacy security, privacy and, and privacy are two sides of the same coin. We are both concerned with the protection of data. Uh, I think where privacy differs a little bit from cybersecurity is that we have a, an extra specialization in um, you know, sensitive information, um, uh, human data, PII, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, you know, I, a good way to a good way to think about this, like just let's just say you had um, a business that created tractors, and those tractors are you know were out on the farm and they're collecting corn, and they're sending GPS data back to a satellite. Well, um, that doesn't have my social security number. It doesn't have my address. That is really it's just um, a movements of that tractor that information still needs to be protected. And there's, there's, there's a cybersecurity angle to that. Now, the minute you start bringing in um, uh, information about me as an individual buying from that farm, well, all of a sudden there is, there's sensitive information in play. Um, and now the, a, a slightly different treatment of the data comes into play. So cybersecurity and privacy are very similar in that sense, one goes horizontal, the other goes vertical. Where I think there's an incredible value of these groups coming together, in addition to the, the, time, the time to value elements that Steve and, and Joe uh, spoke, uh, spoke to earlier, is, is that, um, that there's, there's a sharing of tools and capabilities and sharing of knowledge when those functions are more or less like one, right? In, in some cases, the, you know, some of the advanced tools that we leverage um, and some of the machine learning models that we leverage in privacy are actually very similar to the ones that um, uh, cybersecurity looks like, looks at. I'll give you, I'll just give you a very simple example. Um, data quality, uh, which, it's, which is, it's more, it's, this is not closer to the data governance side of defense. I just wanted to bring them into the conversation so they don't feel left out. Data quality and anomaly detection uh, with machine learning models, right? Where it's over time, the, the model will 
will detect anomalies in the data. It's a, it's a technique that's leveraged by cybersecurity looking at uh, anomalies in, in IP traffic, right? So uh, the more and more that um, these stakeholders can be having um, conversations, sharing capabilities, sharing, sharing tool sets, uh, they, the more and more they can create standards together and um, uh, ultimately, yes, at the end, achieve a reduction of, of the, the, uh, the amount of time it takes to get a project from I have an idea to uh, a new data product. So that the timeliness and relevancy of the end result is is as important, right, as the as the privacy and Correct. security as well. So you have to hit all of those. Um, Correct. Makes a ton of sense. All right. Well, you did such a great job on that one, Awa. You can lead off batter on this one. Right. With regulatory and legal <laughs> frameworks constantly changing, right? Both privacy yeah. and security, right? The SEC is now saying that the boards can have to identify within, you know, 10Ks and annual and quarterly reports who on the board is responsible for cybersecurity. Privacy, you have more and more US states. And ultimately, I do believe there'll be a, a federal privacy law. And then clearly internationally with the GDPR and other, you know, what can enterprises do to stay ahead? Oh, that's a that's a wonderful question, there, Gary. Um, look, I I think that um, and this is this is not unique to privacy regulation. Though certainly you can see this in in in, in privacy regulation more than other types of regulations. Um, enterprises generally have um, a reactive relationship with regulation, um, as opposed to a responsive relationship with regulation. And I'll explain the, the nuanced difference between the two. Um, it, in fact, let me let me try to do that with uh, uh, an analogy. You know, if I were to build a, for those engineers in the audience, they'll probably get this. If I were to build a, a responsive website, right? It's gonna work equally as well on my desktop computer as it would on my tablet, as it would on my mobile computer. And I, I don't have to build three versions of that, right? However, if I took a strategy of, you know, um, building a desktop site and building a very separate uh, tablet site and a very separate mobile site, if some new device comes into play like a different size mobile phone or maybe a television screen with a browser in it, I might have to build a fourth and a fifth and, and so on and so forth. Building responsive data ecosystems um, that are able to react to changes in regulation is in my mind is the nirvana that we all need to get to. Um, I, I think a lot of organizations rightfully so, um, once they get a sense of where regulation is going tend to um, uh, hurry and and react to that regulation. This is this is probably most enterprises, most industries you look at is the same everywhere. But what if you were to get to a place where your data ecosystems um, are are built in in a way that um, with minor configurational changes you can actually be compliant to the next subset of regulations. Uh, and by and large, if you were to look at uh, most of the, the, the privacy jurisdictions, um, they, they are um, shallow copies of GDPR. I, I mean, they all have the, the, the regional nuances, but I, at the end of the day, if you look at the intent behind some of these privacy regulations, they, they tend to be focused around protecting the consumer. So with some, uh, meaningful um, level of prediction, you can kind of get a sense where most new regulations are going to land. And in, in other cases, you can start building your ecosystems to automatically uh, 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 react and, you know, say, say uh, zip code is, is allowable by um, in in one in one state and in another state it's not right. So if you can build your pipelines to be able to uh, keep the the raw data in a protected state and the uh, that is not accessible, but the the data that you leverage for your analytical use cases can be transformed 
to meet the needs of the privacy like regulations, you can actually do that um, on, a, on a state by state basis. And uh, now long term, is that practical for most enterprises if you know we had 51 different states outside 51 different privacy laws to deal with in the US? Probably not. But the, the reality of it is that we we do have the technology to to get there and um, to just double click on what uh, Joe Joe said earlier. It, it's really that uh, investment that enterprises have to get behind to really achieve that long term vision. Got you, Joe. So in your practice, what do you see as ways enterprises can get ahead of this situation? I think you the uh, you know you have to the. Firms need to get to the perspective of uh, embracing princi strategic principles as opposed to adhering to tactical regulations. So what I mean by that is we know the basic principles behind privacy, like Awa said, are protecting the consumer, making sure that there's consistency between how you said you would use the data uh, in your disclosures and your legal agreements is actually how you're using them. I know, I know one uh, large bank that, you know, a while ago got in trouble uh, for, because, you know, the, the description of how one of their specific products worked from a trading product perspective wasn't accurate. Um, and, and it's the same with, you know, data disclosures. If I say I'm not going to, you know, share your data with a marketing firm and I do, you know, well, then obviously I'm violating the disclosure. So I think that the way to stay ahead is to have those principles in mind that we're going to, you know, protect the client's data. We're going to maintain confidentiality. We're going to adhere to our disclosures. When we create data products, we're not, we're going to do so in a way that protects anonymity, you know, particularly for sensitive data. And if you have those principles in, pray, in place, uh, you know where your data is being used, you know where your client's data is, uh, you can, you can uh, remove it if they request it. If you're able to do these kind of five or six fundamental things, then I think any regulatory framework that comes through is just gonna be a, a couple of tweaks in order to adhere to the specific tactical requirements of those rules. I'll add one thing. There's a firm that I'm just about to start working with that has fantastic policies and guidelines about, you know, what is allowed for the analytics model. Uh, the problem is they have, you know, hundreds of end users who are trying to create new reports and predictive analytics for their clients, challenging those frameworks and the overload of, you know, data usage, demand and clarification versus the two or three people who wrote the policies and, and are responsible for educating them. Uh, it's, 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 it's a burden. And so, you know, one of the things that firms can also do is really try to embed these foundational privacy uh, principles into how they work. And so that it shouldn't become a question of whether I can and can't do this. You're going to violate a disclosure. Yeah. Clearly, you can't do it. Yeah. Gary, I apologize. I, I, I want to interject here and just let you know that, yeah, we're just at less than seven minutes left. Great, thank you. Uh, Steve, any any perspectives on this particular matter? With seven minutes, I'll keep it brief. Um, I feel that clients historically have sort of looked to get outside of the regulation as a way of, 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 of managing, but that's become a very high risk strategy. They've always, they've also looked at point solutions. So I think the, the, the real learning is, you know, grab yourself an owner that can look at this from, end, from an end to end level move away from point solutions, proactively re review the new technology out there. Joe just mentioned he's working with somebody that's got these great things. This new, new technology is really creating a solution that not only solves the, the regulatory lawful problem, but it's also looking to be future-proof in line with what uh, I think Joe said, a little tweak here and tweak there. So I think really it's about making sure there's an owner, there's an owner for, the, for the overall end-to-end -end problem, drive clarity and understanding and 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 test the things in the marketplace. Makes a ton of sense. Um, so Joe, I'm gonna let you uh, lead off in your answer to number six, but I also wanna answer a question from the audience uh, because I think it may tie in, it may or may not, to uh, each of your different responses to this one. Uh, at one point in the presentation, we talked about embedding subject matter expertise into the data. 
We also, also talked about controls that flow with the data. So when we're talking here, and I want each of you to take a shot at this and we'll take other questions uh, as well, but you know, what are the pointers and immediate actions uh, and lessons learned? Well, I'll start out. I first of all, thank you for having uh, me on this panel. It was enjoyable. I really appreciate the conversation. You always get me thinking in the preparation and the actual event. And um, I hope that this was a constructive conversation and well worth people's time. Uh, in terms of immediate actions and next steps, organizations really need to figure out where are you on a spectrum. If zero is it's data is locked down and nobody can get it and 10 is it's the wild, wild west, then you'll have some indication of what you can do to move to that six or seven range uh, where data is secure, it's protected, but we're also able to enable, enable, enable usage. And I think that the most important thing is that companies see data as an asset, protect it as an asset, um, understand, catalog it, and protect it. And then those, you do those and measure quality. You do those, those things, then you're going to be well along the curve towards data maturity and enabling, you know, real analytics use cases that um, deliver ROI. Everybody's so excited about chat GT, GBT. And the reason it was so effective was because it had a tremendous amount of data with which to work, basically the internet. Uh, if we're going to build business specific AI, uh, it's going to need data with business specific, you know, data information, IOT and the like. And so companies really need to get good at making their data available in order to, you know, future proof. Got it. Steve, your thoughts. Yeah, I think um, from your the question you mentioned about this concept of, of leveraging subject matter expertise and embedding controls, I think that's where it, where it comes from. You know, um, whether a client is thinking about operationalizing their AI and machine learning, building a monetization strategy, or literally just on a journey of modernizing their data flows. I think if you've got the capability of embedding subject matter expertise into the data, so you have those controls, it really drives two things. It enables you can to say yes to many, many, many more projects, and it, it ultimately speeds up the approval of those projects. So whether it's four times more and four times quicker, you're really driving that 16 times productivity. By, by literally using that subject matter expertise and embedding the controls into the data. Fantastic. And Awa, we want to turn it back to Shannon with a minute left. So you have two minutes to hit this home. <laughs> okay, no problem. I'll be really quick about it. Listen, um, I, I think um, uh, responsible data usage is really the the, the future here. Um, just just double clicking a little bit on the topic we just had about the regulations. It's, uh, they're, they're a framework, they're the rules that we have to follow. Um, but I think you know there's there's a space ahead of that that as enterprises we could sit there comfortably and and do what's right by our customers. And I think you opened up this conversation, um, Gary, by saying that you know there there is a fallacy in place of of um preventing um uh, analytics by injecting um more and more controls and trust I, I i happen to agree with that i think you can actually still achieve high velocity high fidelity data analytics and also do it in a, in a manner that's responsible and that you know builds trust with your customer that you're you're doing the right thing by them absolutely uh and and that's a great way to wrap it up and i want to thank the three of you awa joe and steve uh we'll turn it back over to shannon Gary, thank you so much uh, for this great discussion. It's been very insightful. Lots of uh, comments going on there that I can see. I just want to let everybody know uh, we will send a follow-up email by end of day uh, Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording along with anything else requested. Thank you so much, everybody. And thanks to Anonas for sponsoring today's webinar and making this happen. Thank you for the opportunity. and. Uh... Let's go with the new water. Reusable Love data it. that's <laughs> privacy respectful and maximum value. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Thanks, y'all. Have a great day. Thank See you. Ya. Thank you.